Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 o Oklahoma OER Summit. My name is Tracy Romano, and I will be your moderator. We have an excellent session today with Ali Sharp, Instructional Designer, Director of Faculty Development, Computer Technology Integration at Cameron University, and her presentation is Personalizing Your Google Scholar Library. Welcome, Allie. Thank you. And just a just a quick heads up, I'm at Langston, not at Cameron. Oh, That's okay. oh I'm so I sorry. No, this that's okay. Fun. I just didn't want anybody from Langston thinking I took a different job. <laughs> or anybody I'm sorry about anybody that. Anybody at Cameron, like, Woo! yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk about personalizing um, your Google Scholar library. There's been some changes with Google Scholar, so I figured it might have been a while. Um, I The thing I love about Google Scholar is how they always have the stand on the shoulders of giants. And that is, I feel like Google Scholar is really going to the original intention of Google of searching the world's data. Um, so hello, <laughs> a little bit about me. My name is Allie Sharp and I am, um, I am getting some of the Zoom stuff out of the way. And I am an instructional designer. I'm also the director of faculty development at Langston. I'm a Google certified educator. I know a lot of, and, and a Google certified trainer. Um, most people see me from the Microsoft side because I love Microsoft, but I do a lot with Google. Um, my email address is sharpa at langston.edu. So email me and let's be friends. Um, and so really, if you have questions, feel free to email me. If you have mysteries, technology mysteries, like with Microsoft and Google, send them to me. I like to solve them. Um, so in the chat, if you don't mind, or even out loud, but what is your comfort level with Google Scholar? With one being like a beginner, five being advanced, like you're thinking, get this lady off the screen, I should be teaching this. Um, what is your comfort level with Google Scholar? And if you don't mind, just drop a number in the chat. So... Three, three's a number, good, three. All right, two to three, two, two, four. All right, so three, thank you so much for sharing. Keep the numbers coming in, three, three. So if there are times where you feel like I need to slow down, tell me to slow down, um, because we have people of a variety of levels in here. So uh, with Google Scholar, it changes quite a bit actually, um, like in small ways. And so those are some of the things that I wanted to highlight. But first, when we think about Google Scholar, remember that this is an academic search engine. All of the um, results that you get are indexed and ranked. So here's that actual thing from Google on how they are indexed and ranked. First, it looks at the full text context in, in, in AI is looking at it. So first it looks at the text, then it looks at the author, then it looks at the publication date. Next, it considers who cites it into the indexing. So it, an unsighted article will rank lower than an article with a lot of citations, which is in a sense how the system can be gamed by um, universities that have a lot of citations for the same article just because students are using it. So it's not gaming like in the sense of being detrimental, but the citations, the number of citations goes to a rank. So if a class is studying how to use Google Scholar, and they all cite the same article. Um, and then something happens later on, like somebody publishes that research or whatever, that games that system a little bit. But also how recently it has been cited and the context of the citation. So being cited in other journals. Mm -hmm. Oh, being cited in other journals gives it the highest rank. Um, and, and then being recent. So looking at who cites it and then looking at the context of the citations all helps with that index result when you're using Google Scholar. Uh, so when 
Um, so when, when we talk about Google Scholar, certainly if you're talking about it with your students, it's important to note the limitations. First, Google Scholar does not replace librarians. Librarians evaluate scholars best. Google uses, or I mean, librarians evaluate sources the best. Google uses AI and looks at the frequency, like the, all the stuff we just saw. Um, librarians can actually look at the nuances of sources and the evaluation. So librarians evaluate best. The next limitation that is, is important to note about Google Scholar is that it feels more comprehensive than it actually is. With Google search, the regular google.com search, if we can't find it, and it's like it's probably not on the internet. But with Google Scholar, it only sees what it indexes and it has to meet that criteria that I just showed you. So it is much less comprehensive than it feels because they're trying to build just an academic database. So, um, and it indexes by page. It doesn't index a whole journal. It doesn't index a whole book. So librarians will know this journal is probably something that has a source you need. Google doesn't index a journal. It only indexes a page. So it feels more comprehensive than it is. And the next limitation, which is what we're gonna talk about today, is that it requires organization. It, it is, it's a clean interface, but that doesn't mean that it's naturally organized and, and Scholar, um, this was one of the training categories in Google training certification was, was Google Scholar. So inside Google Scholar, when you go to scholar.google.com, you see two areas that look very similar. One is your profile. And your profile is what you have written. It's how you present your work to others. You can share your profile with others and they can see articles that you've written. And that's where you keep track of the citations to your own work. So your profile is public if you choose to let it be public. And it's all the things that you control, your work, your articles. Your library is private. It is just for you. You cannot share your library. Um, that is where you're organizing the articles you are reading or citing. It's searchable only by you. So you can search in your library. Um, sometimes people get kind of tangled up in Google because it's like coming up with no results and it's because they're actually only searching their library and not all of Google Scholar. But your library is searchable by you. And then a, a strong reason to use Google Scholar is that Google keeps the links up to date. So if a journal changes their links, Google keeps those links up to date and you can always find them in your library. So it is worth taking the time to, to build your articles that you wanna read inside your Google library. And here's a fun fact. You can export all of your Google library citations as a spreadsheet or as bib text or more. Um, inside Google Scholar in your library, you'll see a little button that says export all. And that is how you can see all of them. So I am going to show you, I have this little video as a backup in case uh, the internet fails us, but I'm going to show you a little bit with Google Scholar. So um, you should be seeing my screen, my Google Scholar screen, but I just want to make sure you can see this. So when we go to Google Scholar, we start at scholar.google.com. So it is a different website than Google. You can't get to this in the advanced search. You have to type in scholar.google.com. And you can see that it will have articles or it will have case laws. Up on the top uh, left, you have the hamburger menu, the menu bar. And then you'll have your profile, which remember can become public if you choose for it to be. And it has the articles that you've written. And then you have your library, which is private. And that only has the articles that you see and it's searchable. So if I'm searching for something, I'm gonna search for Langston. I'll look for our goats. They're so cute. 
if you ever need to see goats, uh, come to Langston and you can see them. Um, you can look and find results. And when you're looking at your um, articles or at your, I'll choose the one that has more results. Um, when you're looking or searching, you'll notice it has an option that says label. Those labels will let you, um, it's how you start building your library. You're just labeling the article. So if we want to choose something, like if I say Langston, I type in the label and um, just put a check mark and I could spell what university right. And then that label will appear on the side, on the left side, and that's creating um, file folders or that's creating our navigation system for our articles that we want to read. And inside each of our results, we see the um, little button to cite something. Like if I wanted to create the citation, I can copy and paste it. Or if I want to do the bib text or whatever, it's all right here. Um, we have the option to um, see related articles, to see different versions. And we can also see how often somebody's cited it if there's articles that have other citations with it. So uh, you can also, you know, change your date ranges of when something happens, um, like when you're, when they come from. So when you're looking inside of Google Scholar, using these tools will help narrow out your results and help you, um, help, help make it manageable. Because if I'm in my full Google Scholar, there's a ton of results. So if you want to find something that you found before, be sure that you're searching in your library, not the full Google Scholar. So um, we're going to come back to this page, but I'm going to go back to my presentation real quick. Um, let me make sure you see my PowerPoint. Okay, so when you're in Google Scholar, you can um, search it just like you'd be searching Google, right? You type in the word and it has the same search op options of all exact one. You can search for articles by specific author authors or um, if you know a journal name that it would be in, you could put in the journal name and you can have them between dates. The default short search goes by relevance and the left sidebar will always re, um, refine the criteria. Use advanced search to limit your results by the author or the publication field or the date. On mobile, it, it seems smaller, but the tools are still there. You can search the Google Scholar library, you find your article, and then the save button is in the star and that's what lets you be able to um, put a label on it. So wherever you see that star, it means save it. And then you'll be able to label. If you just have save, it just kind of goes into like this junk drawer. You want to be able to label it so you can find them by pressing save, create new, and then you just repeat that for as many labels as you want. So when you're organizing your library, because it becomes huge, use those labels to categorize your article, find the article, tap label, select the label, and select done. And then to view it, you click on the label name in the sidebar of your library page. To remove it, you just toggle it and then say done, and it will remove that label. It doesn't remove the article from your library. It just removes the label. So you can manage them. Um, so if you're working on a specific research project, you can label it that way, and then you can put it a different label later on when you don't need it. So um, if you're looking for an article, it, look for that star to save it, the little quotation mark cites it. And then when you see the cited by 2000, however many, that lets you reverse search. Um, again, this is another view that you'll sometimes see, but it lets you save it. And you can also see the PDF version that's in those recommended articles. 
So we save it, we add it, add a label to it because you can put it in multiple categories and then you say done. Um, so there's a new, starting in January, 2022, they opened up reading list and here's the difference between those. The reading list is sort of the dumping ground. It's the articles you want to read later. One way that people have been using reading lists is that um, you may not be able to read it at home, but when you're on campus, you can have the library access and read it. And with that, you have the choices to archive it, to actually label it after you've read it or you deleted it. So when, when Google asks you to put it, when you put something on your reading list, it assumes you haven't read it yet. Your library is for the articles that you value. You usually have the PDF and to remove it, you remove the label. So the reading list is kind of before you've read it. Your library is after you've read it is how it's intended to be set up. You'll see these in the same places. Um, on the left-hand side, it says my library. You'll also see it in my library on the mo on your um, right side. And on mobile, it will usually just have the star or it'll say library if, you, if it has enough space, um, depending on it. So the reading list is one of those categories. It's just that it has the option to label and delete it. Um, your library gives you a few more tools. In your reading list, you can see archive, which means just like put it in your Google dumping ground or delete, you can label it or cite it. And here are some quick do's and don'ts. Google indexes papers, not journals. If you wanna keep articles by journals, you need to make a label for that journal. Google will find a source. So for example, if you look up an article and it's in a journal, but the journal doesn't have the PDF available, Google will show you the source that has the available PDF. A lot of times um, scholars put their work available on their own websites or on someplace that doesn't have a paywall. So Google will have like 15 of the same articles and they show the ones that's most freely available. So if you wanna save it by journal, make a label for that journal because if that citation goes behind a paywall, Google will update it to a to one that's free, like a PDF. Um, if you have authors that you want to follow, you can make a label for them and follow them. So, um, and then you'll see all the things that they're citing, or I mean, all of the their articles and, and things like that, that they're sharing. So, um, oh. So um, that is the like the big tip is that it indexes papers, not journals. And then um, I like to use it to find citations by clicking on the citation and the number of people that can that that will show you the backward search. So then you can see how they're all related, but knowing that all of these results are still scholarly works that have been um, cited by others and that fit those index, the Google's index tool. So here is a don't. Um, do not use programs to download the search results. There is that option to export your um, labels, but there are um, there are like Google extensions that you can use to download pages for things like on a website, you could download all the PDFs on a website. If you do that, in Google Library, it will put you in a timeout um, for usually for like three days and then you're locked out of Google. So it doesn't say this explicitly on the search page, but those extensions that are in the Google shop, that Google extension store that lets you download like all the pictures on a page, all the articles, all the citations, you can't use that in Google Library because they will block you from Google for a couple of days. If they so that comes up frequently in the discussions of Google Scholar. Um, they also sometimes when I'm doing it, I'll get a message that says show that you're not a robot. So it sometimes kind of times out because they're wanting this to be used by humans, not not scanned by people that aren't Google robots, I guess. 
So those are just things to know with Google is that they will lock you out if you go, if you, uh, if you use their tools that they have in their marketplace to download things. So use the buttons they provide for you. Uh, do you have questions? If you've got questions, I've got answers. Feel uncomfortable with it? I'll put the... I could make up questions that nobody asked. Um, okay. If you, an example of the um, external software, that is a good question. So when you are in the Google Marketplace, um, you can find things that will choose. There are extensions that are automatic downloaders, like download this would be one. Um, I'm trying to get into that marketplace to see it because I'm actually using but they're like automatic downloaders or what they are or what they're called. And they are really useful if you wanted to get like all of the, all the something on a page. Um, download plus is one. And then it would download everything on the page. And I've used those before when I needed to get a whole bunch of stuff at once. But with Google, it would lock you out. So it's any extensions that um, are downloading. Google does not want you to use those kind of extensions. And those will definitely um, block you out. So if there's an article that you find that you want to use, we'll look up Oklahoma. Um, if you want to... Uh, download something, you need to use the actual tools that are inside the browser to, to go, to go ahead and do it. Like you would press those three. It's not, it is really meaning for everyone to save it. And then, um, use the article, use the tools that are in your library. I think in part, because they want to make sure that to respect the copyrights of things. So if you're actually using inside your tools, you can use anything inside these tools that you see, but don't automatically download things. So here I am inside my Edge browser. And if I wanna save it, I just press that save button. It wants to make sure everybody's being, acting like a human and not acting like robots to download things that don't belong to, you know, that scholars meant to be read. Okay. Oh, Dr. Sultani just, Dr. Sultani changed his floor to a two. So um, <laughs> that makes me laugh. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. So the website for Google Scholar is scholar.google.com. And here's that little export button, by the way, that kind of just recently appeared. And I am always happy to, um, oh, that was my good text. I'm always happy to help if you have questions, please email me. And I'm putting my email address in the chat. In the chat. I am at Langston. Yes, you are. Thank you, Allie. That was a fantastic presentation. I think no one asked, no one asked questions because you're so far advanced. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Did myself. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Well, we're going to be seeing you at Simon's in a minute. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye bye.